thank you everybody for uh, attending this. Um, it's always a bit difficult to um, attend to a webinar because there's completely different rules from, uh, from what we are used to. But today uh, it's a pleasure to, um, to welcome Professor uh, Cattaneo. Um, we, know, we have know, known each other for uh, about 20 years. Um, Antonino has a beautiful uh, CV. He has a, um, he's a physicist and uh, he, he, worked, he graduated in, uh, in Rome. And then he moved to Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, where he worked, that is one of the top universities, if not the top universities in, uh, in Italy. And he worked with Lam Lamberto Maffei, that is a member of the Ac Academy of Lincei, and I'll tell you more about this academy in a second, but also a very refined neuro, uh, neuroscientist. He then worked uh, to the National uh, Research Council in Rome, under the Nobel laureate uh, Rita Levi Montalcini. And then he had a bit of a tra trajectory in which he worked uh, at the LMB in Cambridge with uh, Cesar Milstein, another Nobel Prize. And then he, in 1991, he became full professor very young at uh, uh, the CISA in Trieste, that is uh, the Institute of uh, Superior uh, Studies of whatever is a very, very prestigious uh, center in, uh, in Trieste. Uh, and then uh, um, after a, a, a period of a sabbatical period again uh, back in, uh, in, in Cambridge, he became full pro professor uh, in Scuola Normale Superiore in 2008. And, uh, and now he's uh, um, president of, uh, of the uh, European Brain Research Institute, uh, Levi Montalcini, an institute that was uh, dedicated to, uh, to Rita. He is the recipient of several um, prizes. He's a, an EMBO uh, member since uh, 1994. Um, he has been elected uh, um, at the Accademia uh, Nazionale of Lincei. This is the oldest academy worldwide. It's the first academy in the world, and it was founded by uh, Galileo Galilei. He, he was also elected in 2010 uh, um, a member of the Academy of Science in, in Italy, and uh, he, he is just uh, been elected also member of uh, the uh, um, Europe, um, uh, Academia, U Europea uh, Academia. Um, that is a, a prestigious academia in Europe. And today he's going to, to, to present some very, very recent work uh, that um, it, the title of his, uh, his, work, his uh, talk is uh, New Tools to Study Synaptic Engrams in the Physiology and Pathology of Memory Formation and Recall. So complicated that <laughs> I really had to, to read it. Antonino, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, Annalisa, thank you very much for this uh, uh, long and uh, uh, not so much deserved uh, I, uh, uh, introduction, but I think I'm very grateful and, uh, and uh, I, uh, welcome to everyone. It's a bit difficult to talk uh, without uh, interacting with people. I'll try to do my best and I'll try to give you uh, uh, a flavor of uh, uh, new work that we are doing in the lab. Uh, as Annalisa said, um, this is uh, new work, and before this is going to be the uh, brief summary of what I'm going to talk. Uh, before going into, uh, into these studies that are the object of this seminar, I want to give you a brief introduction to know where I'm coming from. Uh, the overarching interest of my lab is in the past uh, 20 years has been around, uh, uh, probably more, 25 years, around Alzheimer's disease. And here I will give you just a flavor of two uh, research projects that have been going on in, in the lab uh, that center around two uh, 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 topics of my lab that are NGF and antibodies, as you will, uh, 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 that are part of my history. 
But then I will, I will move in, uh, so this is just to give you the idea of, of established work that is going on in the lab. And then I will, uh, I will go into uh, trying to explain you the motivations uh, for going into memory studies with uh, development of new tools. And I will describe to you a platform that we have established. Uh, we call it the Synaptive Platform. And uh, we are very much excited about uh, uh, this development. And uh, we hope that it will be able to contribute to uh, studying memory in the physiology and in the pathology. This lady is Rita Levi Montalcini, a, 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 a great lady of neurosciences. She, and of humanity as well, she was discoverer of uh, uh, the nerve growth factor and she uh, was awarded for this with Stanley Cohen in 1986 the Nobel Prize. And this is the, the, the molecule, NGF. And as you know, NGF is uh, 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 a molecule that acts as a neurotrophic factor in the brain on uh, in the peripheral and the central nervous system but in the central nervous system it acts on uh, cholinergic neurons of the basal for brain and for this reason the connection between NGF and Alzheimer's disease has been uh, 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 long uh, uh, postulated because of its action on cholinergic neurons that are the neurons that degenerate in Alzheimer's disease and are uh, important for that disease. Uh, however, for reasons that I will tell you in a while, NGF is difficult to transform into a drug. Um, we have uh, discovered by a long story that I won't tell you, a new mechanism uh, whereby we show that the glial cells, both astrocytes and microglial cells, are targets for NGF in the brain and NGF modulates a broad homeostatic system and uh, so uh, these uh, uh, glial cells become uh, a, a target for NGF, and we call NGF not only a neurotrophin, but a gliotrophin. And the mechanism, in, in very short, I won't give you any evidence for this, is the fact that NGF in the brain can act on cholinergic neurons, as you, as, uh, as, uh, as you all know, but uh, we now show that NGF is active on uh, microglia, uh, exerting a highly neuroprotective action uh, through microglia. Microglia is uh, uh, broadly neuroprotective, as you know, for neurons and for astrocytes, but NGF acts also on astrocytes, and uh, we have shown and not published yet that uh, 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 removing NGF from the brain turns uh, astrocytes into the neurotoxic uh, uh, phenotype that is a killer for neurons. So all these points to NGF as being at the center for a, a homeostatic system that when it is unbalanced in the disease uh, uh, can benefit for NGF agonism. So the scope for NGF as a drug is, uh, would be very high. And we have been wondering for many years about how to turn NGF into a drug because uh, uh, NGF is a very, very important pain inducer. And uh, in fact, there are antibodies against NGF and, and its receptor TRAK that are very advanced in clinical development for chronic pain. And the reason why they are advanced for, uh, to treat, you want to antagonize NGF in chronic pain is because NGF uh, is a mediator of, of uh, the neurogenic and inflammatory part of pain. So, and we know this in men because NGF has been tried in, in men and clinical trials have failed because of the pain induced by NGF. So, what we have uh, 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 done, and I will uh, just give you the, the flavor of what we have done, uh, we have been inspired by a genetic rare disease that is called the hereditary sensory autonomic neuropathy, HSAN. There are two of these diseases, HSAN4 mutations in the NGF receptor tract A, HSAN5 mutations in the NGF gene. HSAN4 has insensitivity to pain and severe mental retardation because of significant developmental effects. You, uh, you can imagine this uh, uh, because the brain needs uh, 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 NGF tracky signaling to develop properly. Uh, but uh, uh, very, very, very intriguingly, HSAN5 patients have a complete insensitivity to pain without significant neurological mental retardation. We, uh, and and this, uh, these patients have a, a, a mutation in the NGF gene. We have studied this mutation. We made the hypothesis that this mutation would uh, only affect uh, the pain component of NGF actions and not the neurotrophic component. We have made, uh, uh, confirmed this in, in, in knocking mice that uh, reproduce the disease. And so to cut a long story short, we have uh, 
engineered painless NGF that is a tracheal biased agonist that is fully neurotrophic. It has a 15-fold reduced pain sensitization. It has been fully validated in a large number of cell and animal models. And we are now currently uh, taking this molecule uh, for clinical trials in men for uh, uh, neurodegenerative disorders. Now, let me get to the other. Uh, this is keeping us very busy in the lab, but also something else that keeps us very busy uh, are the so-called intrabodies or intracellular antibodies. We use we have introduced the concept, and I will show you a picture now that I'm very fond of. These three guys here are Cesar Milstein on the left, Michael Neuberger, who unfortunately uh, six years ago passed over very, very young. He was really a rising star and a great scientist, a, a wonderful person and a great scientist. And on the right, uh, uh, Greg Winter. And the three of them in the 80s and 90s have uh, uh, championed what is called the antibody revolution. You know them, you must know them very well, of course. And, uh, and uh, I had the, 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 the honor and the fortune of to work with them, and in particular with Michael Neuberger. And with Michael Neuberger in 1987 first, and then in 1990, we published two papers that were the, 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 the start of the intracellular antibody approach. The idea for those times was very forward looking. Nowadays, it is, it is a quite uh, an established uh, technology. The idea was uh, uh, to use antibody or the antibody domains uh, to interfere with proteins inside, uh, inside the cells, uh, uh, both for, for, for research study and for uh, uh, therapeutic purposes. And what uh, uh, I will give you just uh, the idea now that gene-based methods can be used so successfully to interfere with genes, there are things that genes cannot do. And the gene approaches cannot interfere with conformations of a given protein. Gene approaches cannot interfere with post-translational modifications of a proteins. And gene-based approach cannot target a protein just in one subcellular compartment. And so these three topics uh, have, uh, uh, are, are the developments that we have uh, for, after the pioneering uh, 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 um, uh, start of the intracellular or intrabody approach, as we call it, have, uh, uh, we have developed uh, approaches both on conformational selective interference, on post-translational interference, and on subcellular pharmacology. And I will give you just, uh, so this is, is, the idea is very simple. You harness the diversity of antibody repertoires and you combine it with the cell biology of the protein trafficking. And you can exploit protein RNA targeting sequences. You are really limited by, by, by fantasy. And this was a very early concept that uh, now is becoming popular. I will give you just a, a, a very short example from our work. We have used this uh, to target uh, uh, conformational uh, uh, variants of Alzheimer's or beta oligomers. The question we had was a very uh, precise one. Where are oligomers first formed? Because of course, they can form extracellularly and you can find them intracellularly, but uh, 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 are they formed there or not? And in the absence of molecular probes with which uh, to follow these molecular species, it has been really difficult and the literature was really very not very clear about this. And we decided to, uh, uh, to, to, to develop, well, we developed antibody domains against uh, that specifically bind oligomers and not monomers and not fibrils. These antibodies uh, uh, were uh, uh, selected from our libraries of intracellular antibodies that we have uh, developed and we are continuously uh, upgrading. And we isolated a, a large number of antibodies, some of which are conformational and sequence specific. This is very important. I don't have time to say why, but this is, uh, they are conformation sensitive and sequence specific. So they won't recognize any conformation of oligomeric proteins, but they, as many conformation antibodies do. And, uh, and the question is, where are uh, beta oligomers first formed? And so being derived from a, uh, this is, 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 a, is a neglect, uh, I think, of how cartoons in the literature depict uh, 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 APP processing. It is always depicted as a membrane protein that is cleaved when APP is in the membrane. And then the abeta gets, uh, gets uh, illustrated out of the cell. And of course, abeta is out of the cell, but as a membrane protein, APP first starts its journey into the ER. And so 
uh, we, we, we uh, expressed intrabody against a beta in the ER. These intrabodies are very specific for, for a beta. You, you can use them in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Alzheimer's disease sections and uh, they, they stay in different structures in a plaque. In red, you see what the oligomeric in, uh, domain stains and in, in, in green, what the standard plaque antibody stains. So you see that as you would expect, they stain different things. And here, this is also another example of how you can use these antibodies. And this antibody, uh, this uh, antibody also inhibits the uh, oligomerization of uh, a beta in, in a very effective way at substoichiometric ratio. So if your input here is three micromolar a beta, already with 0.1 micromolar of antibody, you see that you have uh, uh, a very a very significant uh, 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 inhibition of aggregation, and with 0.6 micromolar, that is still uh, highly uh, substoichiometric, you have a total uh, uh, inhibition of oligomerization. So the fact that it acts uh, substoichiometrically and other kinetic arguments that, uh, in this case, Michele Venduscolo uh, calculated for us, uh, we we can also by this functional way prove that they are binding the early oligomers. And, and so the idea was to trap the oligomers uh, uh, if they are formed in the ER by, by targeting the intrabody as a gene exclusively into the endoplasmic reticulum. In fact, it is uh, cycling between the ER and the cis Golgi. And uh, by this way, we can show that uh, uh, you can uh, uh, immunoprecipitate oligomers from the ER, you can block the secretion, you can uh, protect the cells from uh, mitochondrial deficits. And uh, uh, this is very important because if we target the same antibodies to the mitochondria, which we can do by this intrabody approach, you won't protect the cells. So the mitochondrial deficit is protected by an action of the intrabodies in the ER. And we are uh, now carefully studying this uh, 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 mitochondria ER interaction. Uh, by focusing on ER mitochondrial junctions. We are studying this in, in human cells, uh, fibroblasts from patients, uh, uh, stem cell, IPS, neurons, etc. So this is the idea of what you can do with intrabodies and we can do something more. You can, uh, we have designed a, 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 a selection strategy to target post-translationally modified proteins. Uh, the idea is to target, uh, to inhibit the, for instance, the phosphorylated version of a protein without uh, targeting the native protein, uh, or the acetylated uh, uh, version of a protein without targeting the, uh, the, the native protein. And for instance, we did this for uh, acetylated histones, and we can show that uh, targeting acetylated histone H3 uh, gives uh, 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 and, and having a, as a readout a gene expression uh, transcriptomic uh, uh, by NGS, uh, by uh, sequencing uh, uh, profiling, we can show that uh, targeting directly uh, uh, the uh, acetylated histone, as opposed to targeting the protein that is, uh, uh, that is the writer for this, or the reader for this, uh, for this uh, modification, is highly, highly more specific. So, you can, with these intrabodies against post translation modifications, you can really get uh, uh, high specificity. Another thing that you can do with intrabodies, you can take the protein, add an effector protein, and target it to be degraded. In uh, uh, 15 years ago, almost, we, we, we showed that by, by intrabodies against tau, we could target tau in a ligand-induced, inducible way to be degraded to the, to the proteasomes. And this is a very elegant uh, approach uh, that has subsequently been extended. You may have heard about the trim away approach that a few years ago, Leo James and his group in Cambridge have developed. But our technique is, I think, uh, more, uh, is not transient. Is, uh, it gives a stable interference, but you can make it conditional with, with chemogenetic ligands or with light. So this is a type of thing that we can do with uh, to induce protein degradation and, for instance, with intrabodies against the post-translational modification. So, for instance, now we have antiphosphotau antibody intrabodies that we are uh, targeting to, to, to degradation. Okay, so now with this introduction, this shows you, uh, gives you an idea of where we come from. And now I would like to spend my talk in 
telling you uh, uh, armed with all this, but also with new uh, tools, uh, uh, why we want to go into studying the physiology of memory and why we need new tools. And uh, the idea is uh, very simple. Uh, we all know that Alzheimer's disease is, is a disease uh, uh, in which patients suffer from memory. But if you go at an Alzheimer's uh, meeting, uh, you will never, never hear about work being done on the mechanism of memory. You will hear about uh, uh, memory endpoints as behavioral endpoints in, in mice, in models, in rats, in, uh, as, an, as an endpoint, but not as a mechanism. And uh, this is quite, uh, is, uh, after many years uh, going and uh, attending this community, I, I, I find it a bit, a bit uh, ironic. And uh, the physiology of memory is so important, but also is so important the physiology of forgetting. There is a physiological forgetting that our uh, uh, great uh, uh, ancestors, William James, Théodule Ribot, uh, great psychologist of the 19th century, had said this uh, with beautiful words. One condition of remembering is that we should forget. Uh, forgetting is as important a function as remembering. And this is, uh, is, is so true that uh, um, in recent years, uh, now this has been the turning point, the study of memory has made tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, uh, advances, te te uh, technological advances. And so uh, I really think, and this has been the vision that uh, I have uh, a few years ago brought to the lab, if you want to dig a tunnel, and in this case, a tunnel is uh, uh, Mount Alzheimer's, but in the pictures are from uh, Monte Bianco, Mont Blanc. And these two pictures are the very moment in which on the left, you see this is the last piece of rock that was uh, 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 brought down before the Italian and the French uh, uh, squads uh, met and exchanged the bottle of champagne. And on the right here, this last piece of wall of rock had been, had been uh, 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 had, had fallen apart. Now, what about, uh, uh, I think my, my idea is, uh, is not a very original one, but I think, I really think I have a strong idea that uh, studying the end, uh, Alzheimer endpoints, as we all do, misfolded proteins, aberrant cellular processes, uh, mice, models, and all this uh, with, uh, that express these Alzheimer uh, 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 proteins, and studies on the physiology of remembering and forgetting, they should meet somewhere. It's like start, uh, uh, starting from two different parts, digging a tunnel, and, 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 and uh, you may uh, uh, half the time in which you arrive at uh, having a, an open tunnel. And this is uh, uh, what a few years ago I have started doing in the lab. And uh, uh, you have uh, the word engram. Engram is, is a very successful word that, uh, that uh, uh, psychologist uh, Richard, uh, Richard Simon in Germany in 1921, he coined for, as, as, the, as the word for, for, the, for the memory, for the trace of memory. And uh, uh, the enduring though primarily latent modification of the irritable substance produced by stimulus, I have called an engram. And for, for decades, the engram was a holy grail. When I started studying and I started uh, being uh, uh, passionate about neurosciences, the engram was really a holy grail. Uh, if you talked about engram, you, uh, uh, it was something that uh, uh, was not, not even well defined in terms of how you should measure it, how you should find it. And in the past uh, 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 10 years, I would say, uh, uh, engram has become a, 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 an entity that you can define uh, measures that you can do uh, observation that you can uh, make and manipulations that you can do to manipulate them. And the cellular view of engrams is that behind the memory, uh, there is a neuronal assembly whose activity is, uh, is induced during the learning phase or during the encoding phase. These engrams are somehow connected about uh, themselves. Something is written in the brain that, uh, that is, uh, uh, is, is later uh, amenable to be recalled. Uh, the trace is dynamic because uh, if it is first for an episodic memory, it, it, if it is first formed in the hippocampus, then it, it, after a few weeks it, it goes to the cortex. So, but anyway, it is a trace, and it is a trace that is at the spatial scale of the cells. It's, uh, it's a, 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 an assembly of cells that are 
uh, uh, connected to each other and that uh, when you recall them, uh, when you reactivate them, you will, you, you will recall the memory. And how do we, this was the idea. How do we know it? Now this has, is what has happened. And so the, uh, there are really a group of people around the world that, has, that have uh, made, allowed us uh, to make a tremendous progress on this. The groups of uh, 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 Mark Maper, uh, Franklin, Shina Jocelyn, Suzumo Tonegawa, they have really made tremendous program, uh, progress. And, the, and the, the idea is that now we can exploit the promoters of immediately genes, such as chipos, that are strongly linked to the activation, neuronal synaptic activation, to drive uh, reporter genes uh, so that you can genetically tag neurons active during the encoding phase. And then you can use these tagged neurons to study them, uh, to, 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 to interfere with them. And for instance, in this experiment, uh, for the first time, it was able to show that uh, 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 the, 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 the neuronal assembly that is activated during the learning phase by opening a window of opportunity with some inducible genes, such as uh, doxycycline, uh, 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 the same set of neurons is also activated when you recall, in this case, a peer conditioning memory in the amygdala. So you can really start looking at the, at the, at the trace cells. But in addition to looking, uh, you can also manipulate them. For instance, uh, uh, this is, is, is a landmark paper by Suzumo Tonegawa group uh, 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 in 2012, in which uh, 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 under the promoter of the CHIFOS immediate gene, there is a tetracycline transactivator, and then you have uh, channel adopsin optogenetic protein that is also fluorescent that is under the control of the tetracycline responsive element. So with this, uh, uh, with this uh, 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 set of constructs, uh, if you allow uh, tetracycline transactivator to act, by, in this case by removing doxycycline, you have a window of opportunity during which you can label the neurons and have them express channel rhodopsin. For instance, if you place a mouse in a cage exposed to the, to the blue context and you shine light, nothing happens because they are on doxycycline. But then you move them to a, to a context B, you remove doxycycline so that the whole circuit uh, goes. They start expressing channel rhodopsin and you associate a, a foot shock. So now the, 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 uh, uh, there is this association between context B and the foot shock. Then you bring back the mouse on context A and where the mouse was not shocked. But if now you shine the light and, you, and, you, and, and so that you activate the channel rhodopsin, and so now every time you shine the mouse, the mouse undergoes a, a freezing, uh, 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 a fear response. And if you put them in the dark, a few minutes later, they don't freeze and so uh, on and off. So this is reactivating optogenetically uh, a set of cells that have been uh, 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 activated with uh, uh, during learning and you can reactivate them and, and the other trace for that particular fear conditioning memory. You can use this also to create false memories and Tonegawa did some very fancy studies with this. Now, so far so good, but we have stu we study in textbook that uh, we have a, 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 the current view of how memory works is that uh, 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 synaptic plasticity is, is, is going on. Uh, uh, when, when we learn something, the efficacy of synapses can be modulated, can be uh, activated, can be weakened, and so you have phenomena like long-term potentiation, LTP, long-term depression, LTD, and, and, and this is really a truism that uh, uh, the, base, the structural basis for, 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 for learning and memory is, is, is synaptic plasticity, and, and you will find this written in, in in every uh, 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 textbook and paper that, uh, that talks about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, this uh, uh, synaptic plasticity and long-term potentiation. Despite this, uh, uh, there, is, there is really uh, a very only correlative evidence, but very strong correlative evidence, that uh, treatments that affect LTP also affect memory and vice versa. But really there is no casual, uh, ca uh, causal, causal, uh, cause and effect relationship between a synaptic plasticity change and a, 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 a memory uh, uh, behavioral redoubt. So 
engrams are cellular or synaptic assemblies? This is the question that one should ask. And uh, for the cellular engrams, tremendous program, uh, progress has been made uh, uh, by, by, by formally demonstrating necessity and sufficiency. So you can ablate a population of neurons and ablate the corresponding memory, or you can reactivate a, a population of neurons and, and range, uh, uh, recall that memory. So this uh, is this, where the state uh, really uh, of research is, and, and the current engram technologies are very powerful, and, but they have a cell-wide spatial resolution. Because when you reactivate a neuron, you are activating all the neuron and all the synapses of a neuron. So you need new experimental tools to reduce the spatial resolution of engram technologies down to the synaptic level in order to ask necessity and sufficiency questions about synaptic engrams. So this is the task that we embarked in when we started this uh, 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 now uh, uh, for uh, five years ago. And, and this was the motivation for the development of this. And so the idea is can we develop a tool to map potentiated synapses in living animals? Is there such a synaptic engram? And can we reactivate potentiated synaptic inputs? And is this necessary and sufficient for memory recall? And so how did we do it? We did it exploiting the normal physiology that synaptic plasticity is telling us. We all know that when a neuron is activated, gene expression starts, uh, 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 a signal goes from the activated synapse to the nucleus, the novel transcription starts, RNAs start uh, traffic to the, to the, to the, in the, in the, in the, in the dendrite in this case, and uh, in a translationally repressed way. And then if a synapse has been stimulated, it has, it is also tagged and the synaptic tag and capture mechanism that Richard Morris uh, uh, pioneered uh, uh, allows that RNA to be translated and so that uh, this now is a local translation. So this is the mechanism that we decided to, 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 to use, to exploit. Uh, and this is uh, a first study that we published a few years ago. And Francesco Gobbo, uh, a very gifted PhD student in the lab who is, is shown here, he's now in Edinburgh. And he spent his PhD uh, slaving on this project that was a very risky PhD uh, project and he turned it into a very successful PhD project. And the idea was very simple. Uh, uh, we exploit, want to exploit this mechanism. And so we took it, we, we tested many, many different uh, uh, genes whose uh, that are, were known to be locally translated. Uh, I won't tell you all the attempts that have been done. We landed on ARC. You know that ARC is a very strongly induced immediately gene whose RNA is very strongly transcriptionally induced. His transport is transported at the, uh, at the dendrites. And we, we made a construct. In this case, we have a channel rhodopsin fused to a fluorescent protein. And we had the RNA targeting sequences from the five prime UTR and the th three prime UTR of ARC. And then we also added, uh, this is one set of construct. And then another set of construct, the protein has also a synaptic uh, targeting protein sequence. Uh, this means that once the protein is locally translated, the protein harbors a protein signal that will cons should concentrate it into the, into the, uh, the, the postsynaptic density. And uh, so, this, uh, uh, rem remember the nomenclature, the, the, the protein to look at, the concept to look at is SA, that means uh, synactive, has the synaptic uh, targeting sequence and the ARC targeting sequence. And if you express this construct in hippocampal neurons in culture, you see that progressively, uh, uh, the, uh, the three constructs uh, are uh, progressively more localized. Here on the right, you have a filler, and you see that the synaptic construct is really expressed selectively at a few spines that uh, uh, we presumed at the time that they might be uh, synapses that happen to be potentiated. We can do also the opposite. We can express the construct and, uh, and treat the cells with treatments that are known to uh, uh, induce uh, synaptic potentiation. For instance, treatment with BDNF, chemical LTP or the polarization with KCL. And all the treatments that induce uh, 
potentiation in the synaptic construct that has a dual protein targeting sequence, as here, uh, have a very high enrichment index of expression at dendritic spines as opposed to, to uh, the dendritic shaft or other parts of the neuron. And uh, the construct, is, if you look more carefully and you zoom into the spine, you can distinguish between spines that we call docked spines, where the fluorescent signal and the postsynaptic density signal coincide, or spines that more broadly are expressing spines, but not docked, where the, uh, the staining is within a 0.6 micron circular side. So you see that for the synaptic construct, the, the percentage of docked spine is much higher than the percentage of uh, 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 the non-dual uh, uh, targeted signal, whereas uh, uh, at the non doc spines, uh, the, the percentage is the same. And then if you measure, you know that spine volume is a proxy for long-term potentiation. A spine that undergoes uh, 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 long-term potentiation gets larger. And we can use Homer AGFP, a synaptic protein, as a measure for, as you see here, for the spine volume. So if you plot the volume of the spine with the enrichment for the uh, synaptic probe, you see that you have a supralinear uh, 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 correlation showing that uh, uh, the synaptic concept is expressed at potentiated spines. Uh, another marker for, for a spine that is undergoing potentiation is surface expression of AMPA glutamate receptors. We can have a pH sensitive super ecliptic uh, uh, glutamate AMPA receptor. We co express in neurons uh, the, uh, the, the super ecliptic uh, AMPA receptor that gets fluorescent uh, in green only when it is exposed outside with our synaptic probe. And you see that you have a co nice co localization between the green signal and the red signal at this spine that is expressing uh, uh, AMPA receptors on the surface and uh, and, and our probe. And you see that you have a very beautiful uh, linear correlation between the synaptic uh, expression and, uh, and the AMPA exposure. And you don't have this for the other constructs. This, now you can, you can, you can ask, uh, uh, so far we have used, uh, we have used this, uh, this, uh, pr uh, this probe only as a fluorescent probe. We have not exploited the fact that it is uh, uh, a chanerodopsin. Sorry, no, we are not yet there. And now we do something else. We do a, a two-photon glutamate uncaging. So you do a focal stimulation by two-photon glutamate uncaging. You have a MNI that is glutamate, uh, a caged glutamate. When you focus on it uh, a laser beam, uh, uh, and you can focus it very precisely by, by two-photon microscopy, uh, glutamate is released and it activates only the dendritic spine that is facing this uh, uh, spot. Uh, as you see here, you see that this red dot is the, where you shine uh, your laser, and uh, and 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 so you are uncaging the 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 glutamate here, and you see that uh, after uh, uh, an hour, you go and look at the fluorescence for your synactive uh, chanerodopsin uh, uh, protein, and you see that it is expressed at the spine and not at uh, and not uh, this is the the filler and not at the adhesion spine. So you can have a, a, a very, very uh, precise uh, synaptic, uh, uh, local synaptic expression. And you see that uh, the relative change in, in intensity of fluorescence, uh, it is uh, 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 at the stimulated spine and not at neighboring spines. And it is highly specific for the synaptic construct. This labeling now, is protein synthesis dependent. So this now formally proved because this spot will not be measured if you do the same experiment with protein synthesis inhibitors. So now you measure the volume increase and you, and you see the classical LTP-like uh, 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 volume increase. And you see that the expression of your synaptic probe follows very precisely this increased volume. If you give a protein synthesis inhibitor, you only have what you would call an early LTP for the spine volume. So you have a transient spine volume increase, but you have no expression whatsoever. And if you don't shine the glutamate, uh, you don't have this. So this shows that the expression is translational, uh, is protein synthesis dependent. And now you can exploit the fact that it is uh, a channel So now we start illuminating 
the channel rhodopsin that is expressed locally at the uh, uh, potentiated spine. So now we have a channel rhodopsin that is only expressed at a spine that has been potentiated, which is the goal that we wanted to reach. And so now we want to ask is, if we now activate this channel rhodopsin, is it, uh, is, it, uh, 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 is it active? Because uh, you never know and you have to demonstrate it. And, and we do here a double uh, expression of uh, the synactive channel rhodopsin with GCAMP, that is a, calcium, a genetically encoded calcium indicator. And so uh, uh, you can, you can uh, 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 monitor the calcium influx, and this is shown here, with, uh, uh, after you shine the blue light for channel rhodopsin. And so you, can, you, you see that you have uh, 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 an increase in, in fluorescence uh, uh, of due to calcium influx uh, when you shine the light, but not when you, uh, when you don't shine the light. You have it uh, when you shine the light on the, on the dendrite, on the spine, but not when you shine it in, in, in the dendrite. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, this increase in calcium is blocked by uh, voltage-gated calcium channel blockers showing that uh, when channel rhodopsin is activated, cal uh, channel rhodopsin is a poor calcium uh, 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 permeator, but uh, uh, its depolarization opens voltage dependent, uh, induced uh, opens voltage dependent uh, uh, calcium channels. And, uh, and, uh, and you can also treat the culture with TTX to, to be sure that uh, what you are uh, seeing is not due to network activity. You can also uh, measure uh, 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 other markers for synaptic potentiation, that is, for instance, phosphorylation of calcium calmodulin kinase 2 that is downstream of the opening of NMDA receptors. And you see that uh, here uh, uh, you have an immunostaining for phosphorylated calcium uh, calmodulin kinase 2 that colocalize very, very precisely with the uh, expression of the, of the, of the chamerodopsin. And, uh, and uh, uh, you have this uh, uh, only in the light and not in the dark. And so, and this is quantified here. And then uh, you can also show that when you shine light on chanerodopsin, the whole neuron gets activated because you have an increase in GFOS staining uh, in the nucleus. So the optical activation of chanerodopsin drives cell-wide neuronal activation. All this was in vitro. Now we can go in vivo and we want to ask a, a few questions. First of all, uh, shall we able to monitor, to, to see potentiated spines in vivo? And this was the first question. So the experiment was a very simple one. And then we shall uh, gradually get more complicated. Uh, here the concept was, uh, uh, if, you, if you put the concept in vivo and you don't regulate it, uh, it will, uh, all synapses that are potentiated by, by ongoing activity will, will start expressing the report. So you need to have an a window of opportunity. And so you have a doxycycline system. In this case, it is a tet on. So you have the synactive construct under the control of the tetracycline responsive promoter. And you have the tetracycline transactivator under the control of a, of a, of a constitutive promoter uh, uh, with, with, a, with a fluorescent protein. We did the in utero electroporation uh, at uh, embryonic day 15. Then uh, uh, at P20, P23, uh, uh, we inject uh, doxycycline. The uh, day after, we perfuse and we do imaging. And uh, in this case, the behavior was very simple. We simply uh, either we keep the animals in the home cage or we move them to another, to another cage. So it's the simplest behavior that we can do. And the uh, uh, first thing that we, uh, we can uh, measure the, uh, I don't know if you can see them, but these arrows point to specific uh, uh, synapses that have been potentiated, that have been labeled by the probe. And this is the corresponding filler of the same image. So for instance, concentrate on, on, on the picture two and two, that is an enlargement of this larger picture in the, in the hippocampus. And, uh, and what, stri what is striking here is not only that uh, the, the, the signal is very, very uh, precisely localized at the dendritic spines, but uh, also that there is a virtual absent. Uh, here there are three nuclei, three somas, and no labeling whatsoever is in the soma. So this is something that uh, uh, worried us very much because when we shall be doing the, 
the, the reactivation experiment, if we shine in vivo light to activate a channelodopsin, we want to be sure that the channelodopsin is not reactivated because we are reactivating the somatic uh, 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 channelodopsin. So no somatic labeling is very good news. But then we can, we can do some statistics on what is a statistical distribution of the, of the, of the, uh, uh, of the synapses. So we count the nearest neighbors, uh, 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 potentiated to a potentiated or a potentiated to a non-potentiated. And, uh, and we do this for many nearest neighbors. And then we do a cumulative distribution. And, uh, and we, uh, uh, we show this both in the, in the CA1 and in the dendrogyrus. And we show that the potentiated spines in the hippocampus are closer than chance to each other they form so-called synaptic clusters. Now, this is important because this has been the first measure that we can do in vivo for what is the geometrical arrangement of uh, potentiated synapses on, in a living animal. And, uh, and even if it is ex vivo, but the synapses has been, have been potentiated in vivo. And this is, is uh, relevant because the computational scientist uh, uh, I have been uh, discussing a lot. This is a paper by uh, Panayota Poirazzi, a, a, a great uh, a Greek uh, lady who is a great uh, computational neuroscientist. She's doing beautiful work and we started collaborating with her and they have uh, uh, shown models with uh, uh, showing that uh, uh, in models uh, synap uh, cluster plasticity is a mechanism uh, that uh, makes uh, information binding across time, space, or context highly more efficient. And, and, we, uh, and we are now providing experimental data for her, for her models. Um, in conclusion for this part, uh, and then I will uh, uh, walk you uh, briefly through the final part, is uh, that we can, uh, 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 we have established a platform with which any reporter or actuator proteins can be expressed at potentiated synapses. We can use this platform to map potentiated synapses in areas engaged by memory. We can reactivate previously active synapses. This we are heavily involved in and it is ongoing. We can profile molecular differences in potentiated synapses by combining this platform with proteomic platforms. And, uh, and uh, ongoing, we can do this, all this can be done in physiology and of course in pathology, because now if we combine this platform uh, either with, with these, these models or even by cell autonomous expression of Alzheimer's disease, uh, uh, disease uh, genes or therapeutic genes in a cell autonomous way, we can distinguish between engram cells and non-engram cells about the synaptic properties. So this is our project for, for, for the next uh, many years, but uh, we are very, very, very uh, uh, hopeful that this will, will bear fruits. And the ongoing work very actively is the reactivation uh, experiment, exactly the same experiment that I told about Tonegawa. We want to probe the synaptic engram theory by uh, loss of function, gain of function, that instead of uh, of, uh, of uh, tagging neurons like was done, we want, we now tag uh, synapses and can we ask, is the reactivation of potentiated spines sufficient for memory recall or can the reactivated ablative spines in a contextual peer conditioning serve as a conditioning stimulus? Uh, if I can have uh, uh, five or 10 minutes more uh, of your time, uh, Annalisa, do you think I can? Uh, I will tell a last small story and then I will come to an end. Here, the idea is to compare the synaptic and cellular memory trace in the mouse hippocampus after more complex uh, behavior, the fear conditioning. So here now we are approaching something, something in the direction that we want to do. So now we have a vector for imaging, which is a variation on the theme of what we have, I have shown you so far. This is in cell, we have in the meantime improved it. And, 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 uh, and you see the, that you have all this labeling by, sp uh, by spine that have been uh, potentiated uh, by, due to uh, the activity in the culture. If we stimulate the cultures, these, uh, uh, these la uh, dots go uh, increase. If you inhibit an, uh, 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 NMDA receptors, you see that uh, this labeling uh, disappears and the non-targeted construct uh, uh, stays, stays uh. This shows uh, 
the green dots is the synaptic label and the, and the, the uh, uh, whatever color is this, uh, fuchsia is, uh, is, uh, uh, is the filler. And you see that you have no somatic or dendritic uh, uh, labeling whatsoever. You have really uh, labeling very precisely at these, at these uh, uh, spines that, uh, because of what I told you earlier, they are potentiated spines. And so now we want to map potentiated spines in, 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 a, in a behavioral task. And what we do is, again, we have a, we have a tetracycline uh, a controlled construct, we have our imaging construct, uh, uh, and that is tetracycline uh, dependent, and we have the transactivator uh, that is red. So in vivo, these are CA1 uh, neurons. You see that in vivo, you see these, uh, these uh, 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 spines that are labeled in, in CA1 neurons after in neutral electroporation. And, uh, and uh, it is now these spines that we want, uh, these potentiated spines that we want to measure uh, uh, in, in this uh, behavioral uh, 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 protocol. So, uh, mice are, uh, undergo a fear conditioning. So, on day one, they receive doxycycline to activate the, the reporter. The, 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 to activate the opportunity for the report to be expressed at potentiated spines. Um, and, and, uh, and on day two, they under, they, we, we move them to a cage that is uh, cage A, where they receive a shock. So this uh, group remains in the home cage. This group uh, 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 is shocked and then it is sacrificed immediately after shock. So this will monitor the encoding phase. And then there is a group that has uh, uh, done the same treatment. Uh, then it is brought back to the home cage and the next day it is brought again either to the same context, context A, so that the me fear memory is recalled or it is brought to a different uh, uh, cage, cage B, where, the, where the, the memory should not be recalled. And so these two groups will, will, will measure the, the, the recall phase and this group will measure the, 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 the uh, uh, encoding phase and and so uh, what you what uh, uh, this is is going to be measured in the hippocampus and and we me we do these measures in these different layers this is a pyramidal layer uh, a pyramidal neuron of the of the hippocampus and and the different layers the different layers are relevant because they receive different inputs so the stratum audience this is a cell body layer, and then the stratum radiatum that we divided into the proximal and the distal stratum radiatum and the stratum la lacunosa moleculare. And you see that each, each uh, 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 layer receives a different uh, 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 presynaptic innervation so that uh, uh, if we see any change, we can correlate it with the innervation. And so what we measure is, uh, we measure the fraction of uh, tagged synapses uh, 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 with respect to the total number of spines. So with the filler construct, we measure the total number of spines in the different layers. And with the, with the, with the synaptic construct, we measure what proportion of these are potentiated. So this is done in the different, sorry, in the different layers, stratum orions, stratum radiatum, distale, distale proximale, stratum lacunosum moleculare, for the different experimental groups. And first thing that you see, you see that fear conditioning in all groups shows a great increase of tag spines. This effect is more pronounced in the stratum orients and in the stratum lacunosa moleculare, uh, where, however, there is no difference between encoding and recall, uh, because there is no difference between uh, uh, FC and AA. However, there is a significant difference between fear conditioning, encoding, and recall, in the stratum radiatum. So this is already telling us that the stratum radiatum uh, potentiates new, spine, new spines during the recall phase. The stratum orients potentiates uh, uh, new spines more in the, in the encoding phase. And this type of data uh, could not be, these are controls in which, uh, uh, which show that no change when you do fear conditioning and no recall, when you keep a home cage of 24 hours, Everything goes as it should, no change. Uh, now, the final thing, and then I come to an end, is, uh, is compare the distribution of the potentiated spines with the distribution of the classical engram. So 
measured by the CFOS labeling as the Engram technology allows to do. And so now we combine the synactive labeling with a probe that is now turquoise, that is a destabilized fluorescent protein so that it follows the time kinetics of, a, of, a, of an emitter gene. Under the control of ESARE is a synthetic promoter of ARC gene. Uh, it combines the ARC enhancer and the ARC promoter. And we see that there is a very good overlap between the turquoise reporter and the endogenous CFOS. So all this, uh, this uh, 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 works very well. And so now we do a double uh, staining between, uh, the, uh, uh, we measure the proportion of synactive potentiated spines and uh, the immediate gene labeled, so classical engram neurons in our experimental paradigm. And so here you see uh, 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 that uh, uh, you, div uh, you divide by the different groups, the group that remained in the home cage has uh, uh, really uh, no major difference. The first difference that you see is that the group that underwent fear conditioning have a higher proportion of uh, these are the synac, uh, 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 the ordinate in these, in these plots uh, is a fraction of tagged neurons that are also uh, 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 false positive. Uh, uh, the turquoise ones versus the gray ones that are not, uh, not positive. And so you see that there is a, a higher number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 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 um, uh, potentiated spines in the fear condition group, and there are different uh, 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 layers that, have, uh, that are potentiated in the recall. And so the summary of this is shown here. If you, if you, if you draw a correlation between the different experimental groups and the fraction of potentiated spines in the, in the different layers, you see that during the encoding phase, you see that the stratum orients and the stratum lacrimosum moleculare are more red. So there, there is a greatest proportion of potentiated synapses. During the recall phase, there is a greatest proportion in the stratum radiatum, uh, whereas uh, the recall with the wrong cue, so these are not recalling the memory, don't have uh, potentiated spines. So this is really starting to see the synaptic memory at work. We can, we can uh, uh, draw this uh, uh, initially during the acquisition, since this is uh, uh, where uh, we see the highest proportion in the stratum audience of potentiated spines. During the encoding, this is where the fear conditioning stimulus potentiates more spine. During consolidation, uh, stratum radiatum starts to, to, to potentiate synapses. And then during the recall, this is where the recall stimulus really goes. So to conclude, the engram trace cells or synapses, we now have tools to, uh, to ask this question and to ask this question whether a such a thing as a synaptic engram uh, really exists and if we can measure it, and, and, uh, and uh, just a final, uh, if the reporter is a proteomic uh, 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 byte, now what we can do is uh, we can do proteomics of a potentiated spines. Currently we do the proteomics uh, uh, by simply by doing a homogenate of a brain or by expressing a proteomic byte with a cell specific promoter. So you can do cell specific uh, uh, proteomics. Now we can do synapse specific, potentiated synapse specific proteomics. And so we are collecting initial data from, from uh, 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 hopefully uh, to uncover potentiated specific interatomic changes. So exploiting the synaptic platform in the context of Alzheimer's investigations is now our priority. Combining synaptic platform with Alzheimer's targets, models, questions, and hopefully we shall be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. This is my synaptic group uh, that is uh, part uh, at Squa Normale, Francesco Gobbo, who is now in Edinburgh. Now uh, the group is Marco Mainardi and PhD students, Agesha Jacob, Andrea Pareone, Maria Chiara Di Caprio, and Francesca Chiara Latini. At Ebri, uh, Silvia Marinelli, who is PI, who is an electrophysiologist, is, is uh, 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 collaborating with us with her group, and then these are some of our collaborators. And I thank you very much for the attention. Sorry for being a bit late. Thank you. 
Thank you, Antonino. I think it was really a brilliant seminar. Um, there is already a question from uh, uh, Oscar Lazo. Uh, Oscar, would you like to formulate yourself the question? Um, I can allow him to speak if he's in the chat. Um, Oscar, if you want to raise your hand or I can let you talk. Um, Oscar, would you like to, to ask the question directly? Yeah, happy, happy to do it. Yeah. This is, this is as, as I said in the chat, about the cellular definition of the engram. Because we, we um, as, as you said, the, the, um, it, it corresponds to us an assembly of cells, or in this case, of synapses, right? But the same synapses and the same neurons can be um, part of several engrams, right? Yes. Can be part of different assemblies. Yes. And and then um, not we we may think on the not not only connections are important here, but also synchrony between different spines at the same time, different synapses at the same time. What would we call functional transient assemblies? Yeah. So how how would this system deal with that limitation of of the manipulation system? Because we certainly here we miss the the that time variable. Yes. Uh, one way to address this is a very good question. Uh, by the way, it is a question for, for, for the cellular engrams as well. And, uh, and of course, a combinatorial diversity of a cell or a synapse being part of different assemblies is uh, uh, in a way solved by combinatorial. But anyway, this, of course, a similar uh, 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 stimuli might uh, have quite overlapping combinations. One way how we are dealing with uh, for the synaptic uh, ensembles is uh, by expressing time-related uh, uh, time uh, fluorescent proteins. At the moment, we have a reporter that is a timer fluorescent protein with which you can do two time points. Uh, you can uh, activate, uh, 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 you can shine light and uh, or you can change the light of the timer. So this is one way how we can uh, deal with, uh, with uh, this time uh, uh, issue. Uh, that anyway, the time issue is, uh, is uh, as I say, in common both to the cellular and to the synaptic assembly concept. Thank you very much. Other questions? If you'd like to speak to ask a question, you can raise your hand. I'm Sam Cook. Oh, hello there. Uh, thanks very much for a fantastic talk. Amazing system. Um, so my question was whether you could use cheetah, whether you showed you could use cheetah to reverse synaptic potentiation. So if you used high frequency stimulation, you can potentiate a synapse where you've expressed cheetah. Can you use low frequency stimulation to reverse that change and take the synapse back to basal levels? And the reason I think this would be interesting is because you would need that to test causality because in the ideal circumstance, when you actually get around to trying to instate a memory using synaptic change, artificial synaptic change, you would allow a natural memory to form and then reverse that and then reinstate it at those tagged synapses. Brilliant question. I thank you for this. This is uh, exactly one type of uh, experiment we are doing. The idea is we are doing the experiment along the lines of, you, you certainly know the Nabav et al. paper in which they substituted, uh, they did a tone uh, fear conditioning so, and they substituted an acoustic tone with, uh, with, uh, with an LTP from, uh, from, from the uh, acoustical thalamic uh, nuclei. And, and the experiment is, uh, they did is, uh, was exactly to, 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 to show that you could uh, play with LTP and LTD to, to, uh, to uh, 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 reinstate, uh, ablate first and then reinstate the memory. That experiment was one of the motivations for our project because in that experiment, there is one part that is missing that is, uh, they are stimulating a whole bunch of neurons. They are not stimulating cells. So your question, I'm, I thank you for your question because 
uh, if you ask that question, it means that I was able to convey the message of what we are trying to do. And uh, so my short, this is a long answer to the, for, uh, that short answer is, uh, we are doing it, we think that this is uh, uh, an experiment that would exactly address a type of question. Mm. Thank you. I, I agree with you that the Nabavi paper is, is fascinating, but yes. it's, it's somewhat crude because it's, well, it's in the amygdala, exactly. in the yeah. amygdala which allows it to be performed exactly. in that way because it's these very constrained pathways, but the elegance of your system incredible elegance would be to target synapses very, very specifically. And so you have this wonderful opportunity to, um, to reverse and then reinstate. It would be quite incredible, actually. Thank you. Yeah. More questions? Can, can I ask, can you ask a, a, again your name, please? Because, you know, when, uh, when uh, in this uh, strange uh, virtual system, you lose contact to people, to real, to real people. Okay. Sam Cook. Yeah. Sam Cook, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll and, 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 the and the previous uh, speaker. No, I mean, I'm asking simply because I'm, <laughs> I at least want to have a feeling of, of being part of an audience. <laughs> Oscar Lazo. Oscar Lazo. Ah, okay, I see it written. Thank you, thank you. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. We have another question from Edward Azevov. Um, he's raised his hand, so I'm going to allow him to talk now. Yeah. Um, Yes, th thanks for, for the great talk. Uh, early in your talk, you mentioned that uh, e an ER retained uh, anti uh, uh, A beta oligomers antibodies showed a somewhat surprising efficiency, uh, given that the, the, the common notion is that the cleavage occurs in the endosomes on the surface. So, what, what's your take on it? Do you think that uh, that, that secretases actually can act in the ER and the, the product? Uh, can oligomerize in this organelle, and, and to what extent do you think ER is contributing to to this um, uh, potentially pathogenic uh, oligomers? Well, great question, and of course, I only could show you a summary slide, but uh, you are right. The the, the current uh, uh, credo is that uh, the endosomes are the site for cleavage. Uh, the targeting of what we showed is what. Uh, what I think is a formally uh, robust and watertight demonstration that cleavage can occur also in the ER because uh, the, we measured very, very carefully the retention of the antibody in the ER with the SECDEL system. When I say ER, let me qualify. It is ER plus the Cis Golgi. So my statement is that cleavage can occur between the ER and the cis Golgi because there is, we can immunoprecipitate oligomers from the ER. Uh, we can block them there. We can uh, uh, show that uh, this does not interfere with, uh, with uh, uh, APP processing. The antibody is uh, in fact target, recognizing a beta after cleavage and not before cleavage. So we, we, are, we are pretty sure that uh, 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 we are not uh, uh, sterically hindering the, the processing. So uh, um, if you are interested, I can, uh, we, can, we can maybe, I can send you some, uh, some uh, paper and papers and, and we can discuss it. I'd be happy to discuss it. More questions? If not, I really would like to thank uh, lots and lots of times uh, Antonino, and we hope to, to have you in, in the flesh later on when the, the, co the COVID scare uh, stops, and, uh, and it would be much nicer to, to discuss directly with you. Thank you thank so much. You. Thank you very much, Annalise. Thank you to all of you, and I hope really uh, to meet you soon. Thank you. Ciao, ciao.